Okay. Yes, Can we you are. Hear me? Yeah. Yay! Okay, good. Okay, fantastic. So, I'm gonna pull up my notes. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, welcome to Delisters of History. My name is Fega, and I am your resident history talker. Mm-hmm. History talker. I am. I am Isa. I am a history learner and reactor, and I study history myself. But not this person that we're gonna be talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So. We're talking about Rebecca Gratz today. Uh, like I said, when we were walking up here, I was like, we're going to talk about Jews. Jews. We're Jews. Yes. So <laughs> so we're excited. <laughs> this is exciting for us. That said, <laughs> so this is interesting. I've, I've been, there's a TikTok going around, apparently. I haven't seen it. Okay. That says that to this year is very unique. So even though this is going to come out after the Christmas season. Mm-hmm. But we are recording it within the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. And this TikTok says that this year is super unique because (laughs) celebrators of Christmas and Hanukkah can use Advent calendars because they land during the same time. Huh. And this irritates me. (laughs) Because I should say, I, I like Christmas. Yeah. Um, I, I did, I, I grew up in an interfaith family, so I did grow up celebrating Christmas. We both Christmas. did. Yeah. Yeah, we are both Christmaka. So I, I don't celebrate Christmas anymore, but okay. I, I, I enjoy that other people enjoy Christmas. I, I like going to Christmas Village. Yeah. And drinking mold wine. For sure. Oh, it's great. And like enjoying other people's lights and yeah. stuff. Like yeah. I am, I'm that kind of Jew. Yeah. I love that I get to enjoy a holiday without doing any of the hard work. Like, love it's it. fantastic. Yeah. But Hanukkah is not connected to that in my mind. Like, Christmas yeah. is Christmas. Yeah. And this is just my opinion, that I think people should just say Christmas when they mean Christmas mm-hmm. versus holidays. Like, which holiday? Yeah. Christmas. Yeah. Uh, I say this also as someone who buy, who recently bought Hanukkah-themed leggings. So, like, <laughs> grain of salt. <laughs> On this one. <laughs> I, I'll say I enjoy Hanukkah. I understand the frustration with the overblownness of Hanukkah in that it is just like, you know, not our biggest holiday. It's not in the Torah. It's not in the Talmud. I don't know. I can it's name a number about, of... like, killing people like us who are descended from interfaith Jews. Yeah. Like, the Maccabees would not have been on board with the yeah. way we exist. I'm, like, not a fan of... A lot of Hanukkah things. I am a fan of celebrating it though, yes. because it's fun. Because I like fried potatoes. Yeah, and I love menorahs. I, I love, love a good so Hanukkah. Crazy. I have my i. It's my menorah is one of my favorite possessions for sure. Um, I made a menorah one year. Oh my god! Uh, it is a menorah Rex. <gasps> yes! yes. Oh, I've seen. It's excellent. It's yes. excellent. Oh, yes. I, 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 I. That's a beautiful menorah. I made it. I'm very proud of myself. Uh, so- yeah, no, ha- ha- uh, December is often a very big month for me because it is Hanukkah, it is Christmas. I also come from an interfaith family, and it's my birthday. So Ooh. it's a big, big time. Big month. <laughs> big month. Yeah, so I I bring this up because, well, the the brought up the TikTok because what irritates me about it is that it's like Advent is a specific time of year mm-hmm. in a specific religious tradition. Yeah. And that's great. Like, I'm excited. Like, do your Advent. That's awesome. Advent's fun. And And you can get the pet calendar. You can get treats at Trader Joe's. Yeah. Yeah, and they're really good. And Hanukkah doesn't have an Advent calendar, and that's okay. Like, you can Because there's no reason for it. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would we wait to wait? Like, that's kind of what that feels like. Also, a note... 
Hanukkah intersects with Christmas all the time. It's not that special. Right. And it's not even on a special day. Not it's that there not, is a special day of Hanukkah. It's like, I think I'm like the sixth night or something. I'm going to say that and I'm going to look it up afterwards it's and not, find out it's wrong. Sure. But, <laughs> but it's not that special. Like, and, and, and that's okay. all the time. And that's okay. okay. What was special was when Hanukkah landed on Thanksgiving. That was special. Yeah. Yeah. That's not, that's, that's more rare also. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. like once every bajillion years. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So I bring this up because Rebecca Gratz was a Jew who was really concerned about assimilation. Mm. But in a way that is interesting versus, you know, there's always these people, any fellow Jews in the audience know, there's always these people who are like, oh, no, Judaism is disappearing. Ah! There's a crisis of whatever. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it's usually saying nasty things about Jews like Isa and myself. Right. And um, it's a moral panic, and I really just never stand behind a moral panic. Right. So I want to make it clear that Rebecca was not that. Mm-hmm. But she was concerned about assimilation. So mm-hmm. Rebecca Gratz, she was born in March of 1781. So in the middle of the American Revolution. Mm-hmm. She was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, though she spent most of her life in Philadelphia. Okay. She was a middle child Amongst 12 children. Wow. 12. Oh, my gosh. I was saying, I was going to say like me, but then, you know, quickly it became not like me. Yeah. <laughs> so her parents were Miriam, Miriam Simon and Michael Gratz. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael emigrated from German-speaking Silesia. Okay. Which is now Western Poland. Okay. In 1752. And Miriam was the daughter of a merchant in Lancaster. And they were both observant Jews. Uh-huh. And they were members of Mikveh Israel. Okay. Mikvah Israel is one of those things that's just sort of known here in Philadelphia, but not outside. Mikvah Israel is the oldest continuous living congregation in the United States. It's pretty wild. You need all those words yeah. because without them, it is not so. <laughs> but it is an Orthodox Sephardic synagogue. So, let's see how in the weeds we're going to get here. Yes. So there are different kinds of Jews, and this is important to the, to Rebecca. Yeah. There are the two main groups historically we can get into other terms that have come up because of politics whatever but the two yes. main historical groups are ashkenazi jews and sephardic jews uh-huh. when ashkenazi jews which i believe we both are we are yes <laughs> um ashkenazi jews are when you think about american jews you're thinking like brisket matzo ball soup <laughs> mel brooks cats uh-huh. is delicatessen yeah that's Ashkenazi Jewish culture. Mm-hmm. Those are Jews who are from either Central or Eastern Europe. Mm-hmm. Sephardi Jews are everyone else. But in the context of revolutionary America, these were people from Spain and Portugal. Mm-hmm. And I say everyone else because there were Jews in Spain and Portugal, and then a little thing called the Inquisition happened. Yeah. Uh, 1492. And Jews fled and ended up in all sorts of places. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's a large variety of tradition within the Sephardic community mm-hmm. that there does not exist in the Ashkenazi community for a variety of reasons. That mm-hmm. again, whole other podcast, very complicated, very, very complicated stuff. There's also people that have a lot to say in terms of definitions yeah. about different, like how how people ascribe to different sects of Judaism and whether they ascribe, like when they convert if they are Ashkenazim or Sephardim, which is also confusing to me and not something that I understand very well. There's uh, a lot of politics that go into it. There's a it. lot of politics. There's also other terms. There's Mizrahi. There's people that are from many different parts of the world like that don't ascribe Israel, to either. And, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. A lot. There's yeah, a lot. But if but, you are sitting in Philadelphia in 1781, sure. it's a there long are time two ago. types of Jews. There are... Ashkenazi Jews from Germany, mm-hmm. and there are not very many of them, or Silesia, places like that, but mm-hmm. this would have been considered part of, like, sort of the Germanic world. Right. Or you are a Spanish-Portuguese Jew in Sephardi. Mm-hmm. And it's hard for us to imagine now because Ashkenazi culture is so dominant. Ashken- uh, we call it Ashkenormativity. Because we, we love words for specific things. <laughs> um, but that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually quite the opposite. Mm. The Ashkenazi community was actually very small. Hmm. And so... The point of all this was that Rebecca's family, even though they were Ashkenazi Jews, attended Mikvah Israel and would have followed Sephardic traditions. Yeah. Because that was the dominant culture 
in the United States at the time. Cool. I did not know that. Yeah. That was the dominant culture. Yeah, it's hard for us to imagine now. In the era. That's fascinating. Yeah. And it's it doesn't change until our people show up, the Russian Jews. Right. And then we just have a lot of people and just, just a lot of us. every other culture oh, this is fascinating also because of somebody you know how people are wrong on the internet sometimes all the time yeah they're <laughs> even sometimes myself yeah. occasionally <laughs> i'm never wrong <laughs> <laughs> ever um but the you know I, I you know i shouldn't go down this rabbit hole basically somebody was talking about how Jews were white from the beginning when they came here as slave owners. And I was like, man, you really had to bring this up on TikTok because, like, how am I going to talk about, like, how is anyone going to talk, like, respond to that in a comment or a minute? But, like, that's a very wrong way of looking at the Jewish history because, yes, there were some, there have always been Jews that have embraced whiteness to the nth degree and in so doing are also very racist and will do things like own or trade slaves uh, at the same time. Also, at that point, that was an extreme minority. And very quickly thereafter, again, most Jews in the U.S. that were not the super rich were not treated as white and would have probably been even more so the case for our Sephardim siblings yes and no but i could be wrong about all of this so sort of okay so this actually does relate to rebecca's story but it was all flip-flopped so now we think oh my gosh so i was wrong about everything no so cut that out no 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 you were right (laughs) Uh uh-huh you were right it was just that sephardim were considered closer to whiteness interesting okay because they were the ones who had money Oh, wow. Because they were here longer. Like, that's just all there was to it. I just, okay, cool. Um, but, and I could do a whole Not episode cool, but, on ah. on Jewish culture in Philadelphia. It's very interesting. Very but interesting. Rebecca was not Sephardi, but she still would have been at a Sephardi synagogue. Because mm-hmm. that's where, if you were of a certain class, which she was, that's where you went. Mm-hmm. And so the Jewish community, like I said, very heavily influenced by the Sephardic families that arrived first. In 1775, there were about 300 Jews in Philadelphia, which at the time was a city of Mm 35,000. That number grew significantly when the British occupied New York City from 1776 to 1783 Mm -hmm. because a lot of the Jews up there fled south to Philadelphia. Okay. That's actually when Mikvah Israel got its first synagogue. Mm -hmm. Up to that point, they were only meeting in people's living rooms. Mm -hmm. But the the New Yorkers showed up, built helped build the synagogue, and then they left. Oh wow! Leaving the bill with the Philly Jews. Oh man! Um, Benjamin Oops. Franklin actually gave some money to help hmm. support it. Uh, not very much, but that's okay. Yeah. Rebecca's family, though, they had wealth. They got their wealth through trading with the Lenape, who are the people who own the land here that we are sitting on, mm-hmm. and through land speculation and coastal shipping. Okay. So the way that a lot of people in North America who were European earned their money. Okay. Initially, the business was run by, by her grandfather, father, and uncle, who were named Joseph, Michael, and Bernard, mm-hmm. which is a great name, Bernard. Mm-hmm. Uh, but eventually was taken over by her brothers, Simon, Hyman, Joseph, Jacob, and Benjamin. Mm-hmm. At 19, her life changed a lot. So up to uh-huh. that point, she's just like, she's a rich kid in Philly. Okay. Let's be real. Yeah. And... But in 19, her father had a stroke, and she, as an unmarried daughter, was put in, that he was put in her care. Mm -hmm. And she really struggled Mm. with that. Mm -hmm. For some reasons that are just sort of like, you know, she was used to, like, getting to just do whatever, and now she had these responsibilities, which is always hard for anybody. Yeah. But also because she didn't feel herself really naturally inclined towards nursing. Mm. But she was the unmarried sister, so that was her job. Uh, What made it even harder, though, was that he, after her father recovered physically, he experienced a severe depression. She just, it just was a really hard thing for her to take on the role of a caretaker for a severely depressed person. Yeah. And she really leaned on her sister, Sarah, who's an older sister, who 
also had to learn to take on that role of caretaker. At this time, she's now coming into adulthood. 19, of course, is grown, Mm -hmm. basically, in the 18th century. And she was deeply impacted by the ideas of Victorian society. So it's hard to think about this, Mm. but we are now entering the very beginning stages of what we culturally think of as Victorian society. Obviously, Queen Victoria, not there yet, whatever. But the ideas that become that... It's a long time ago. ...are are floating around. And a big part of that was the concept of the spheres of influence. Hmm. So the spheres of influence was this idea that men and women aren't... And, of course, I just want to put in there, there are more genders than men and women. Yes. I know, as am one. But yes. in history people were writing about men and women so yes that's what we have that's what we um, have that's what we have here with us today yes so there was this idea that men and women were equal but they had different spheres of influence mm. so men would be outside of the home working running their business what have you Especially in the upper classes, because if you were lower class, your business was probably in your home. So this was also a class difference in here. I mean, if you were the woman, the home was your domain. That was your sphere. That was your sphere. Okay. And for Gentile American society, part of that was religious instruction of children. Okay. But this is uncomfortable if you are a Jewish person in America at that time, because Judaism doesn't put that traditionally does not put that role on women Mm -hmm. the traditional jewish way of splitting labor in the home is the woman does a lot of the grunt work which could involve running the business Mm -hmm. this is actually part of why a lot of jewish immigrants in new york were really heavily involved in like sweatshops and unions and so forth a lot of them were women because they were used to this idea that women went outside of the house and, and did stuff. Yeah. Um, this is definitely my family's story. It was, you know, Bubby Sarah was the one mm-hmm, running the push cart peddler business, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, nine, the nine men yeah. were the ones who would study religion. Yeah. I mean, you know, we can go do, do our fiddler on the roof thing of, you know, men go. Fine fiddler. On the roof. On the roof. <laughs> the sugar, eh? The, the, the Yiddish version has been refri- reprised. Yes, I saw exciting. that on, on TikTok. Oh, yes. Um, if you are on Jewish TikTok, it is quite apparent to you that the Yiddish version is yes. ready to be seen. So this is a weird thing for somebody like Rebecca, who is an upper class person, who is also Jewish, mm-hmm. because Gentile society, which she is and wants to be a part of because, Mm -hmm. again, there are 300 Jews and they are not all high class, Mm -hmm. say that the role of a woman is is this sphere of the home and of morality Mm -hmm. and of religion, but her religion is saying quite the opposite. Interesting. Yeah. So she does what any wealthy woman in Philadelphia does at that time who is unmarried and wants to make a difference in the world. She joins benevolent societies. Mm -hmm. This was the only acceptable way at the time, for an upper-class woman to engage in public life Mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. So she initially joined a lot of these in in a way to try to stave off the influence of proselytation. Okay. So a lot of these benevolent societies just took Christianity as the assumption. Uh Uh-huh. But there were poor Jews, and they would be in this position of having to make a decision between receiving care and giving up their religious principles. Wow. So she joined a lot of these organizations to be the Jewish voice at the table. Yeah. She did help found a organization in 1801 called the Female Association for the Relief of Women and Children in Reduced Circumstances. I love how people named things. (laughs) (laughs) So specific. Yeah. Yeah. And so this was technically Mm non-sectarian. But the reality is, even though she was part of founding it, it became very Christian. Mm. This was all about helping widows, mostly of the Revolutionary War, and other, quote-unquote, deserving poor. Right. So You always gotta decide who deserves it. Yeah, so the the poor people that... Better not be drunk and gay. Yeah, nope, not that kind of poor person. Yeah. (laughs) Um, 1815, she helped found the Philadelphia Orphan Asylum. Same deal. Technically non-sectarian, but Christian. Mm -hmm. And then in 1819, Mikvah Israel, so her synagogue 
founded the Female Hebrew Benevolent Society for Women in Reduced Circumstances. Yeah. And this is a very different thing because this is specifically for Jewish women. I was waiting for the, the Hebrew to come in. Yeah. yeah. So this is what the terminology changes over time for any group of people. Mm-hmm. And in this time, the accepted term for Jewish people was Hebrew. Hebes. Yep. Yep. So it's weird for us to hear now because it sounds extremely formal. <laughs> Formal and, yeah, I guess, and also, like, you're just, you know, don't, it's, it don't, don't go around calling your, your Jewish friends Hebrews. No. Um, <laughs> if you do that, if you do that. formal and offensive. <laughs> so. Yeah, it, 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 it comes with the connotation now of people who claim that we are false Jews and things like that. Yeah. So, but this was the term at the time. Yeah. And so what this, this uh, benevolent society was about helping usually women who used to be wealthy who like their husband died or like gambled away their fortune or something like that uh-huh. so that people wouldn't realize that she was poor uh-huh so that sort of thing so she really really saw her role as a wealthy jewish woman in philadelphia to help less fortunate jews so they didn't have to give in to evangelicalism yeah is and this, is this why there were a bunch of New York societies like this, too. Was this the original reason they were set up? Was because the like the other places were only giving to Christians? Well, it's not that they didn't only give to Christians. They expected people to follow Christian. Like, it's kind of like you see this today where some like food banks and stuff where they'll be like, yeah, anybody can come, but we're going to say a prayer to Jesus at the beginning. Okay, yeah. That's yeah. my perception. I would assume the New York ones are the same. Yeah. Um, I don't know as much about... New York's Jewish community. Mm-hmm. Most of my knowledge of New York's Jewish community is really just sort of tangential to Philadelphia's Jewish community. You know what? There's enough historians working on New York. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is good. I think we we need we need more people working on a Philly Jewish history because it's, as you can tell, pretty fascinating. Yeah. So this was what she really started to get passionate about yeah. was helping Jews in quote unquote reduced circumstances. And so she decided she needed to become very dedicated to Judaism herself. But she is a woman in a traditional Jewish synagogue, so she does not really have much in the way of Hebrew knowledge. Uh huh. She definitely does not have any knowledge of Aramaic. Uh huh. So she can't study the Talmud. She can't study the Torah. Uh huh. So she needs to find other ways of getting this knowledge. Most of the Jewish education at the time was. When a boy was coming to become bar mitzvah, he would study with his synagogue Mm -hmm. to learn how to read the Torah. And that's it. And if if people wanted to become, like, rabbis or other religious officials, then they would do more study. Yeah. But if you were just hanging out, and this is relatively true today, right? Like, most people, like, they know how to say the blessings they need to say in the home. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, that's it. That's their entire Jewish experience. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But she wanted to do more. She wanted to know more. But there just wasn't a lot of literature in English. Mm. And she imported what she could from England. Again, she's wealthy. Mm -hmm. And she also started to become very good friends with a colleague of sorts named Isaac Leeser. Okay. He eventually moved to Philadelphia, but he was not originally from Philadelphia. He was, I believe, in Richmond. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he wrote a lot of books about Judaism in English. Hmm. Gratz, though, as much as she was really focused on Judaism and Jewish life and so forth, did have a lot of friends who were not Jewish. Mm -hmm. She particularly liked talking to people who were thoughtful and well-read. And one of those people that she became extremely good friends with was Washington Irving. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. And she, who was also friends with Sir Walter Scott. Uh-huh. Yeah, so because of this, Sir Walter Scott wrote Ivanhoe. Yeah. And some people think that the character Rebecca <gasps> was based on her. Oh, my goodness. We don't know. And I, I'll, I'll t- I admit this is one of those things that I repeated as a tour guide over and over, and finally I was like, I don't know anything about Ivanhoe. <laughs> Oh. And so I watched the movie from the 80s uh, because I don't have time to read uh-huh. a novel. Uh-huh. And oh boy. Oh boy. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I will say, I know one thing about Ivanhoe and it also, it, it, and I would say, oh boy. <laughs> yeah, so this is the first, Ivanhoe is the first time in 
English literature, English language literature, mm-hmm. that there is a positive depiction of a Jewish person. However, With as a, a Jewish note. person, <laughs> as a Jewish person, I watched this and I did not find it to be a particularly positive depiction. So, tell me when to stop talking about this. I will. No, it'll be quick. I'll be. It'll be quick. Ivanhoe is the one of the foremost literary examples of a Jewish stereotype known as La Belle Juive or the beautiful Jewess, and. It also contains the stereotype of the Jewish, of the ugly Jewish man, which is held in contrast to the beautiful Jewess. La Belle Jouy for the, the beautiful Jewess is the stereotype of a very beautiful, very luxurious, very well-read, well-mannered, and just over-the-top, rich, rich Jewish woman who's often very kind and very beautiful and very smart and is just the eye of lust, like lust, like very, like people lust after her. It's an over-sexualizing, very much, there's a there's an overlap with Orientalism here. And it's a very, it's a little, too little studied part of art history. And this shows up in opera also, it shows up in um, different forms of literature and in art history, Delacroix is one of the most foremost Orientalist painters who paints, or not necessarily Orientalist, more, does more La Belle Juive type stuff, and his painting of Baron de, de Rothschild is one of the most important paintings here. The Rothschild family being the subject of countless conf- conspiracy theories for their excessive wealth and the idea that they control everything. So the beautiful Jewess is a really important and wild anti-Semitic stereotype that you can kind of be caught off guard with at first because it's full of positive connotations, but at the end of a lot of these literary tropes, increasingly actually through the decades, more often she eats, she meets a very violent end in her life. And I will yeah. note in this particular movie I saw of it, which was from the 1980s, I the the minute her father, whose name I cannot remember, Rebecca of York, being mm. the character from Ivanhoe, shows up, my wife and I just dissolved into mm. laughter because he looked like he stepped off of the set of Fiddler on the Roof. He yeah. was very Tevia esque, mm-hmm. um, you know, big long beard and like the huge nose and the bushy eyebrows yeah. and, and the whole the whole bit. And he had one of those cone hats that I want to own. <laughs> <laughs> these are these hats that Jews were required to wear in some places in yeah. Europe in the Middle Ages. Yeah, but Rebecca was not even played by a Jewish person, mm. which in and of itself I don't necessarily have an issue with. But mm. she had very petite features. Mm-hmm. She did not read as a stereotypical depiction of a Jewish person, Mm -hmm. which with all of those problematic things that go along with that of like who we think of as looking Mm -hmm. Jewish and Mm -hmm. so forth, the fact of the matter is is she didn't look like any depiction that you might imagine or not imagine that is truth of a Jewish person. So I had very mixed, mixed is a strong, I don't know. I I didn't love it. This This is a part of it too, is the part of the story is her father is this kind of overbearing, overlord, learning Jewish man that is usually is usually depicted in an incredibly anti-semitic way and the and the the man in this stereotype in this and when you tell the when when stories of the beautiful Jewish are told she's usually yeah in contrast to an incredible like an over-the-top depiction over anti-semitic depiction of a Jewish man yeah and so I think it says a lot that Rebecca read this mm-hmm. and sent a letter to her sister referring asking her what she thought of <laughs> her namesake <laughs> so part of why people think that this rebecca of york was based off rebecca gratz was first of all because rebecca wrote to her sister and was like how do you like my namesake uh-huh the other reason is because rebecca of york did not marry the protagonist because of religious differences mm-hmm at least that's what everything I ever read about Rebecca Gratz says. When I actually watched it, I was like, also, he was in love with another person. Like, yeah, like, that, that was, was a part of it. That it wasn't was a just a part of it. It was the yeah. entire plot of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> the entire plot was yeah. he wanted to marry Lady Rowena. Yeah. yeah. And then Rebecca of York shows up and is like, 
here, I have a magic Jewish herb that will heal you. This is a real thing that was in it. In, in a movie I, from the, the 1980s. Jewish... 1980s. I was alive in the 1980s. <laughs> I have the magic Jewish herb. You know, there are some people who still practice Jewish herbalism today, but but they're not but magic, magic herbs. <laughs> not magic herbs, and an increasing an increasing amount of people who think that we are all demons and witches. Um, yeah, which is unfortunate. Have horns? I have none. I I don't. Well, you know, it's weird when you're <laughs> patrilineal because they grow in later. Right. <laughs> This is a joke. <laughs> this is a joke. Intercommunity joke. Don't laugh if you're not a patrilineal Jew. We are both patrilineal Jews. Yes. So we have lots to laugh about. Yes. So much. To, through the tears. <laughs> through the tears. <laughs> By the way, if you ever want some wonderful videos, a couple of people have been making some very lovely videos about patrilineal Jews recently on, on TikTok. And yeah, they're all very affirming like, and very lovely. <laughs> there's this um, like super orthodox guy who's been doing some really lovely it must things. be that the, you've been seeing the guy. With, with the baseball cap. With the baseball the, cap. With the Magna Vita. Yeah, and he's like, Patrilineal Jews, they're Jews. Stop counting them not as Jews. It, it, something like that. Yeah, I mean, he, <laughs> he's he's a believer. Oh, we're not, I mean, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> let's, so, keep, let's keep moving on. Let's keep moving on. This is, this is we're going to get into the weeds real quick. Well, let's um, the <laughs> nobody cares about this <laughs> other than Patrilineal Jews and the people that choose to make this into an argument who are... Wrong and annoying. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come at us with halacha says. We know. So anyway. We are um, <laughs> So anyway, um, there's a rumor that Rebecca Gratz had the opportunity to marry, but she didn't because he wasn't Jewish. Mm-hmm. And the reality of this is really unclear. So for a very long time, I know I as a tour guide would like be really dismissive of this theory. Because it just seems like we just need to find a man to hang out with Rebecca Gratz. Mm -hmm. That said, I did do a little more research because I have learned the hard way that sometimes I have assumptions about things Mm -hmm. that are not actually based in fact. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find any proof one way or the other. However, she did write four poems on birch bark sheets tied together with a pink ribbon that spoke of loving a man whose religion prohibited their marriage. This is one of the poems. This is the best of them. <laughs> so, buckle up. <laughs> Sorry, Rebecca. Not a poet. Sorry, Rebecca. The world receded from my view and not remained but love of you. I hung with rapture on thine arm, unconscious of the stern alarm. Of interfering faith must come and call the one. I, I can do this. And call the wandering mortal home. The moment given to joy is o'er, and love and bliss are mine no more. Rebecca. Rebecca. The rhymes, the rhyming. I'd rather it not rhyme, you know? Yeah. That's a part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's a part of the problem. Is I like I wish that the rhymes it's almost distracting. But this is like this whole thing though of her like having this like gentile lover. Yeah. Is it's wild to me because this happened so long ago and yeah. we talk about it like it's still gossip. Like this book that I based most of this off of, which I meant to say at the beginning, which is Rebecca Gratz, Women and Judaism in Antebellum America by Diane Ashton. Okay. This is a book that is part of a series of books that Sometimes Jewish organizations put out, they're like, look at all these cool Jews that existed. <laughs> but the author is And actually, sometimes they're women. Yeah, look Not at that. Not usually. So this is on occasion. <laughs> um, but Diane Ashton is, is, is real. Um, <laughs> she is a professor of religion and director of liberal studies at Rowan in New Jersey. Cool. And it actually comes up, you can tell, like, the last chapter, suddenly she gets super analytical. So cool. up to this point, I'm okay. like, oh my god, this is so boring. Yeah. And at the end, she just, like throws all this analytical stuff in and you can tell she probably if she had been able to write this book the way she wanted to it probably would have been amazing yeah Mm -hmm. but you know it's fine Mm -hmm. um but anyway so she says in this that apparently a lot of this comes from uh the gentleman people think these poems are referring to whose name is sam ewing they had a very deep friendship and it became stormy after he announced marriage to another woman and friends claimed that the closer he got to marriage, the more moody he would get. Uh-oh. But this is all, like, hearsay. This is hearsay. This is, like, more than 150-year-old hearsay. Okay. Um, all right. So it's musty, <laughs> musty hearsay. 
Yeah, and I, I, I've always thought, like, why, why do I care about any of this? Because you know who also never married? She never married. Let's put that. She never yeah. married. Okay. You, you know who else never married? Three of her brothers. And nobody cared. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. Whatever. So, so it actually, so we, we, this, but this whole idea of like, why is Rebecca unmarried is actually a kind of a recent thing because when you had families of that size back in those days, so if you were wealthy enough that most of your kids didn't die by the age of three, which was unfortunately very common mm-hmm. at the time, mm-hmm. you would have a couple women who never married. Mm-hmm. That was just a thing. Mm-hmm. And they served a particular role in society, which was caretaker mm-hmm. to the children of their siblings who died, which actually did happen to Rebecca. Okay. And things like that. Yeah. So this this whole concern about Rebecca's maidenhood, so to speak, uh-huh. came along much later after she died and people were talking about her and they were needed to explain away why she hadn't entered marriage okay but it really wasn't that big a thing um oh also i wrote this down uh part of this too is this is later in the victorian era when they're talking about her and there was a concern that there had a whiff of lesbianism oh no just because she didn't marry there's nothing right she, i mean god i don't know but like there, there's nothing suggesting one way or the other right so they were just suspicious. Yeah, because why else would a woman not marry a man? I don't know. Men are so wonderful. So I asked that question. There is a reason. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. <laughs> we both love you very much. <laughs> um, just you, though. <laughs> I know lots of men. I know. Um, some of my best friends nice. are men. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so her being single, she actually got to control some of her finances. Which was really important because she was running these benevolent societies. So there were actually lots of reasons why she might not have married, regardless of literally anything else. Right, right. Um, But she was loving and accepting of her brothers who Mm -hmm. did marry Mm -hmm. because they didn't all marry Jewish women. Mm. So like I said, she was very concerned about assimilation. Mm -hmm. But she also recognized the human side of things. Yeah, she is cool that yeah, way. Yeah, she's chill. Yeah. So some of her brothers married Christian women, and her whole thing was she just wanted to make sure the kids were raised with Jewish tradition. I think that's fair. And she did it in ways that might have been a little annoying <laughs> because uh, one of her brothers lived, I forgot, somewhere far away. Okay. I want to say Kentucky, but that All might right. be wrong. Far away from Philadelphia. And she would write these letters before every holiday that were like, hey, so... Circus is coming up. Oh my gosh. Just in case you forgot, you need to build a sukkah. <laughs> so I'm sure it was very irritating. She's like that personal Chabad with no help. Like <laughs> have you ra- have you have you laid to fill in today? Um <laughs> It's eight PM. Have you laid your to fill in? <laughs> so um I'm sure it was it was a little irritating. But nonetheless, she was very loving towards her in-laws and in fact there's letters that exist of her that she wrote to her sisters-in-law that were like okay so you married my brother so now we're best friends <laughs> oh so you know that's it, lovely. good stuff good that's stuff. lovely so as the 19th century goes along the demographics of jewish people in the united states and philadelphia in particular start to change mm-hmm. so more poor jews are arriving from central europe Mm -hmm. especially from German states, because Mm -hmm. in German states, Jewish people are subject to a tax called Leibzol, which I'm sure Ben will be like, that's how you pronounce it. (laughs) Uh, Leibzol, it it means body tax. And it was... Leibzol. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I actually used to speak German, but it's Uh it's so so long ago. Uh Um, But it's... Are you any part German? No. So this... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Sidebar, I was raised thinking I was part German Jew, uh-huh. and uh, as my mom's side of the family, my mom's Jewish side of the family, and mm. that's how I was raised, and then I actually did some ancestry research, uh-huh. and that is 100% a lie. Oh, that's so funny. They were from Ukraine. Oh my gosh. But when they came over to the United States, they started telling everyone they were German Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and because there was a class difference. Yeah. And they were able to do that because they came over to the United States so that one of the kids could attend harvard university so Uh 
they were able to get away with that. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, so that was a surprise. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So not German at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so these German Jews are showing up because they were being taxed for existing in yeah. German states. This mm-hmm. is before Germany was a central, like a one piece. Sure. And that, that existed until 1800. And so America was, oh, until, and also in Russia, this also existed until the 1860s. Mm. So America was a chance at economic opportunity. So even though in a lot of those German states, their lives were not at risk, mm. still you look at America and you're like, okay, my life's not at risk. And I don't have to pay money to the local monarch to exist. Right. So they came over here and they were very different from the Sephardic Spanish and Portuguese Jews that were mm-hmm. here already. Mm-hmm. They mostly attended Rudolf Shalom, which oh. is a reform synagogue on Broad Street. It's very pretty. Oh my goodness. It's so gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It's like so much gold and like just beautiful. I have not been inside, but I've seen pictures. Me too. I want to go. I want to go. And they, and they had, I don't know if they have it right now, but they have like a little museum in there of Jewish art. Yeah, they've got all kinds of stuff going on in there. They have lots of stuff going on. So, but anyway, so all these German Jews are attending Rodef Shalom, which was a it was and is a Reform synagogue. Now, today, Reform synagogues are that they're if you are really into Judaism, there are massive differences between Reform and other movements. Mm-hmm. However, from the outside, it doesn't look that different, right? They're meeting on Saturdays for for you know observance of Shabbat. Mm-hmm. They're wearing uh, prayer shawls and. Um, yarmulkes, mm-hmm. like covering their head for prayer. They are do, using a mix of of Hebrew and English. Mm-hmm. It's it to someone who isn't deep in Jewish drama. It it's not a big deal. Different. It <laughs> right. doesn't look that different. But right. that wasn't the case at this time. Uh, reform movement went hard towards assimilation in the early days, uh-huh. going as far as to have their their services on Sundays. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And there is a there is an organ in Rodef Shalom. Oh, yeah. Because there was an organ. And they started doing things like instead of having bar bat um, well, they didn't have bat mitzvahs because sexism. But instead of having bar mitzvahs, they had confirmations. Yeah. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to reform Judaism and right. but in those days that was, word uh, the word the world of assimilation. Sorry, that's what I meant. The right. world, not the word. Um, but, but yeah. It gets complicated because these days, now today, sometimes people kind of like hurl, it's common sometimes for people to kind of hurl insults at like reform synagogues, be like, you you assimilationists, like you should be blah, blah, blah. And they're kind of just like, hey, we're just trying to live our lives and be Jewish just like you guys. And yeah, it's like, and yeah. it's, people should, in my opinion, be Jewish however they're Jewish. Yeah. But it... It, it was a. We're talking about a very different level of assimilation. Yes, in a different time period. In a very different time. Yeah. Um, but Rudolf Shalom, they spoke German mm-hmm. in the synagogue. They didn't use Hebrew at all, but they would speak German, so it's very welcoming to German Jews. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those German Jews were poor, and so they couldn't afford to not work on on Saturdays. Mm. So the services being on Sundays was probably kind of great. Yeah. This was really worrisome if you were someone like Rebecca Gratz, mm-hmm. because. If there's one thing that is consistent through the entirety of Jewish history, there is someone bemoaning the potential destruction of the Jewish people because oh, yeah. somebody is Jewing wrong. <laughs> Consistently. And yeah. this is also, at the same time, lots of things happening at the same time, it's during the Second Great Awakening, oh, which wow. is an important okay. movement in American history where people got super religious mm-hmm. for, well, I mean forever, but even more so. Yeah. We start seeing... Um, a lot of evangelical fervor. Okay. And one of those things that evangelicals at the time were really, really excited about is they, they wanted to convert Jews. Oh. That was like <laughs> the the golden, like, if you did that, you were getting all the heaven points. Oh, um, my. Oh. It was a really big deal. And so Rebecca was really freaked out about that because yeah. you've got these recent immigrants who are poor, who are working jobs that make it hard to take off on Saturdays Mm -hmm. and are going to this assimilationist synagogue, if any synagogue at all. Mm -hmm. And she is very concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, there's these laws going through 
lots of places in the United States, which are laws forbidding the desecration of the Christian Sabbath. Mm. So that meant that if you were a Jew and you celebrated Shabbat, which for us is on Saturday, and then you worked on Sunday, Mm -hmm. you could be fined for desecrating the Sabbath. That's wacky. And where it really got messed up was if somebody was not observant. So a lot of times if someone was observant, they would wiggle out of the fine Mm -hmm. because they'd go to the court and say, listen, I, I did not desecrate the Sabbath. I celebrated my own Sabbath mm-hmm. on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And usually the courts would say, okay, fine. Cool. But if a Jewish person worked on Saturday because they could not afford to take off or they mm-hmm. just didn't care and that's okay, mm-hmm. they would also, they, they, they had no like leg to stand on legally. So they would uh-huh, be fined. Uh-huh. And so she was just really worried about this. Yeah. And... She looks at what Christianity is doing. And one of the things Christianity was doing was founding Sunday schools. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of reasons this happened. It's the Second Great Awakening, so we're very excited about religion and so forth. But also, in Philadelphia especially, there is a lot going on that is not really great. Mm. So Philadelphia is struggling. This is the 1830s, by the way. Okay. So Philadelphia is struggling economically. Okay. Because we lost harbor uh, predominance, preeminence, because New York's harbor does not freeze, oh. and ours does. Oh, unfair. Yeah, super unfair. Okay. So Philadelphia, bef- so during the American Revolution, Philadelphia was actually the largest city in the colonies, mm. which New York likes to pretend is not the case, but it's true. It's true. And we were the capital. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so were they for a little bit, but it's fine. <laughs> yeah, but like, ew. Like, who would want the capital to be New York? You know? Alexander Hamilton. Alexander <laughs> Hamilton can... Yeah, Alexander Hamilton, kind of not great. But anyway, <laughs> um, also not a Jew. I'm just going to put that in there while we're talking about Jewish people. There's this, like, idea that he was a Jew. He was not. And it's so it's it's fine. People can just be yeah the predominant group. It's fine. He was not a Jew, and... Didn't he kind of, like, want America to have a king? As far as I understand, yes. That's pretty crazy. And I say as far as I understand because (laughs) he would just say whatever came to his brain. But still, like, that's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. 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 Anyway. So Philadelphia, struggling economically. And also there's a lot of race riots going on. Mm. And the sort of greatest example of this is in 1838. Nope. Yes, Yep, 1838. Sorry. I wrote 1938 in my notes, and I was like, wait, wait, brain, what? 1838, the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society headquarters was burnt down the day it opened. Ah! So when I say, like, racial uprising, I mean white people (sighs) rioting. Yeah. And so Christians decided, here's how we're going to deal with this. We are going to make people more Christian and have (laughs) Sunday schools. This is actually called the Sunday School Movement. It's a historical movement. Mm Mm-hmm. And Catholics and Jews were like, mm, okay, we need to uh, do something or our kids are going to get swept up in all this. They're going to get sucked in. So Rebecca decides that there there needs to be a co-ed not connected to any particular synagogue, mm-hmm. religious education space for Jews. Mm-hmm. So she does it. You know, this yeah. is what's part of the fun thing about being a rich person. Because <laughs> you yeah. just do things. You just do things. <laughs> so she uh, she founded this and she focused the curriculum on the Bible and the Shema. So the Shema is the attestation of faith, so to speak. It starts with, with saying, like, listen up, Jewish people. Mm-hmm. You know, God's talking now. And it goes through a bunch of stuff we have to do, like putting the mezuzah on the door Mm -hmm. and whatever, things Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And, but that said, again, remember, she's actually not particularly educated in Judaism. Yeah. And there aren't any books for this sort of thing yet. Yeah. So she decides she's going to focus on that. She's going to focus on domestic piety. Okay. Which, if you think that sounds not very Jewish, it's (laughs) because it's not (laughs) this is very much taken from like sort of christian dominant society so domestic Uh piety hearts longing and devotion to god Mm -hmm. god's loving kindness 
and individualized Jewish devo- devotion. Okay. Which is interesting because Judaism is actually not a very individual religion. It's very communal. Very communal. But that was in line with American culture. And it's also part of why this worked uh-huh. in Philadelphia because uh-huh. the individualism meant you could have a German Jewish immigrant child who attended Rodef Shalom in the same classroom as somebody who came from a more orthodox family who mm. went to Mikvah Israel mm. because you could have this, well, you celebrate Judaism the way you do and we celebrate Judaism the way we do. Interesting, yeah. That's why it worked. And she also wanted there to be good teaching and it would be in English. That was the other thing. Is yeah. It's not in Hebrew or Aramaic. Okay. Hebrew school is, is a bit of a misnomer in our today's parlance because mm. it's not, act- even though today in Hebrew school you do learn Hebrew, mm-hmm. It's not called that because you learn Hebrew. It's mm-hmm. because it's school for Hebrew people. <laughs> That's why it's called that. So, yeah. She tried to do what she could without any materials. So the teachers would go and use Christian materials and just like paste paper over the parts that talked about Jesus. Wild. Yeah. And what? because there's like, this is going to sound stupid, but they're like, Jewish stuff is pretty specific to Jewish stuff, you know? There's some major <laughs> philosophical differences. Yeah. Between it's, Judaism. Pretty, it's not like just like yeah, Judaism erase Jesus from it. Right. Judaism, yeah. Judaism is not Christianity minus Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So I, this is one of those things I struggle with Rebecca because mm-hmm. in part she does understand this and in part she doesn't. Yeah. Because she's a person of her time. That said, though, she's like she's buddies with Isaac Leeser, uh, which – I mentioned before he's from Richmond um and she got she she found out about him because he wrote a popular article speaking against an article that came out in the press that disparaged Judaism as a concept which is apparently a thing you could do in those days was just be just like talk about how Judaism is not like a good idea yeah I feel like that's something that people do these days that's true too but anyway so Isaac Luther <laughs> wrote against that and yeah. got the attention of Philadelphia's Jewish community and so they hired him as as uh, Chazan, who is like the the person who does the singing, mm-hmm. and is kind of a teacher in and of themselves mm-hmm. in a different context in a Jewish synagogue. Mm-hmm. And he actually started uh, delivering Shabbat sermons, which had never been done mm-hmm. before. So that was Isaac Leiser. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rebecca encouraged him to teach Jewish people about their faith, and he worked on writing educational books in English which Rebecca did some pretty heavy editing of Mm -hmm. because he was also German and apparently his English was very German (laughs) so it was somewhat impenetrable out of order yeah (laughs) well it's not even that it's out of order Mm -hmm. it's when you read things translated directly from German Mm -hmm. it's it's there's a there's a precision to it that we don't typically use in English (laughs) That uh-huh. can get you pretty in the weeds. Uh, yeah. So she she lightened that up a bit. Uh-huh. And also one of the teachers who worked at her school, whose name I have. I'm going to mention her because women almost never get mentioned. Rachel, I think it's Rachel Peixoto Pyle. I might have her middle name wrong. Mm. And she wrote a book called Elementary Introduction to Hebrew Scriptures. And Leeser was also working on a English translation of the Bible, mm-hmm. which didn't really exist at the time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so she she being rebecca she really encouraged women to see as part of their sense of duty to educate their jewish children mm. and the hebrew school movement such as it was had some mixed success which is hard for us to imagine now because mm-hmm. it's seen as a universal part of the american jewish experience right but at the time, it was tough because in some places that were smaller than Philadelphia, it was smaller Jewish communities, people would be really put off by the idea of women teaching about Judaism. Hmm. It was seen as just so backwards. Hmm. Not to mention the fact that it was co-ed hmm. and not supposed to be connected to any particular synagogues. Imagine you have a community of only like a couple hundred Jews. How many synagogues do you have really? Right, right. And it gets complicated. Yeah. She continued as she aged... She continued with her whole thing of, like, she is going to create a Jewish version of any number of benevolent societies to serve the Jewish poor, especially Mm -hmm. as time went on. We are seeing... So she's... She passed away in 1869. So this is before the big push of Russian Jewish 
immigration. Yeah. But we are seeing increased German Jewish immigration. Yeah. So she's seeing sort of the beginning of that wave that's going to take us into what becomes what's considered the predominant American Jewish yeah. experience. Yeah. But she is pushing a lot of this stuff. She is trying to get the community to support it. The problem is community does support it, but they don't have money. Mm. So she's getting lots of donations for things like the Jewish foster home and mm. stuff like that, but it's just not enough. Mm. But she's doing the best she can. She eventually dies, just of old age. Wow. And the thing that I think is the greatest sort of memory of her is what her brother Hyman did, mm -hmm. which was he founded Gratz College. Mm. She's outside Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and it, it's in Elkins Park. And it is a school for the education of Jewish educators. Mm. Still exists today because part of her problem was there weren't a lot of teachers who knew how to teach about Judaism. Yeah. And it still exists. Yeah. And we can thank Rebecca Gratz, really, as much as I might disagree with some of her sort of philosophical mm -hmm. differences with me. Mm -hmm. We can thank her for Jewish education being a standard part of Jewish life in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. I, and it makes me thankful that we have books about Judaism in English. <laughs> or it's, just that or in many languages that are that are able to that we're able to access. Um, well, and and this is such a we are living also in a time where Jewish texts are becoming more accessible than they ever have been. Yeah. In the history of the world. You can learn world. Yiddish on Duolingo. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And you don't need to speak Aramaic to read the Talmud anymore. Yeah. Now, before anybody sends me an email, yes, I know if you want to do like the really intense study of the Talmud, it needs to be in Aramaic. But it's, it's, it, I like being I have, able I have to, to have, have a word concept. with the people that are sending you that email. <laughs> <laughs> I spent too much time on Jew books. So, um, <laughs> But I know I love the fact that if I want to try to read that multi-thousand page, it's not even a book, it's series an of endless books. series of pages. Endless series of arguments. Yes. Um, I can. Yeah. And what a gift, honestly, because actually, I wasn't planning on doing this. Mm. However, I just give an idea of what we were missing. Ah! <laughs> In the Talmud. Mm, ba -ba -da -ba -da. We're going to pull up things on the phone. The Talmud is full of important lessons like... What do you do if you're in the middle of the desert and you've been left there by kidnappers? You've turned around three times and you don't know where Jerusalem is. How do you know what direction and which to pray? You can find that in the Talmud. Or <laughs> Rabbi Yermea raises a dilemma. Mm. This is a quote. By There's a, consistently a dilemma. If one leg of the chick was within 50 cubits of the dovecote and one leg was beyond 50 cubits, what is the halakha? The Gemara comments, and it was for his question about this far-fetched scenario that they removed Rabbi Yermea from the study hall and he was a, as he was apparently wasting the sage's time. <laughs> so that, 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 was, that was considered the waste of time. Yes. Yeah. That, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Because I, I will say that's an extreme example, you know? Yeah. That's... Usually, every, every argument is, is considered. <laughs> but my point being, we have access to this in a way that we didn't, and reading mm -hmm. about Rebecca Gratz makes me really thankful. Yeah. That we do have access to this She's stuff. like the Julia Child of Hebrew school. Yeah. I mean, Pretty, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just imagine what she would think if she saw Sepharia today, which is a website with all these Jewish texts yeah. on it, and many of which are translated. I'm sure, I'm sure she would be happy. Yeah, I'm I think sure. she'd be into it. I I think she sounds like she was a cool person. Yeah, from what I know about her. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm into this. Yeah, I, I I like Rebecca. Just you know, it took people like her to get us where we are today. It does. Yeah. Thank you and, for listening. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, and yeah. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you so much for listening to our first three intro episodes of D-Listers of History. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe and drop us a review on whatever platform you listen on. A huge thank you to April Keys for the use of the song Misfit from her album Mountain View. You can find her on all the social media platforms. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and sometimes TikTok at D-Listers of History, no hyphens. A big shout out to the folks supporting us on Patreon. If you want to support us and get access to all sorts of exclusive content, become a patron of this program. All of this and more can be found on our website, DListersofHistory.com. Again, no hyphens. Just smush that all together. The next episode will be coming out 
hopefully on February 6th, and we will start a first and third Monday upload schedule for the rest of season one. And now for an episode relevant audio drop. Oh, I've made it. After 125 years, I'm finally here to visit for the first time. Shalom, everyone. I'm Hyman Gratz, and inspired by my little sister Rebecca Gratz's work, I joined with the Hebrew Education Society of Philadelphia to fund a teacher's college of Jewish education. And long after me, in 1895, it became Gratz College. Though a lot has changed since my day, Gratz College continues to nurture critical thinking and build communities of learners. Now, where is my horse? A Shlomo? Shlomo, there you are, Shlomo. What are you doing over there?